Coming up, author Alexis Lee shares her story of learning to live with a traumatic brain injury and a young man must come to terms with his violent past. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. And today we've got a great guest coming up in just a moment here, but we're gonna be talking about God's grace. And maybe you've asked the question, is God's grace for me? Well, the answer is yes. You see, theologians would call it common grace, meaning we couldn't breathe or survive on this planet without the grace of God. See, grace is undeserved favor. And God has demonstrated undeserved favor to every person on earth. But most importantly, we experience the profound work of grace through our Lord Jesus. Well, imagine your whole world changing in the blink of an eye. Well, that's what happened to our guest, Alexis Lee. Her book, entitled Beauty from Ashes, is her story of conquering the odds after a traumatic brain injury. Well, welcome, Alexis, to 700 Club Canada. Thank you for having me. Well, we're so glad you're here because as you know, we're, we just love, we believe in the power of testimony. And this testimony is so, so powerful. Your book uh, is a story of how you survived a traumatic brain injury. So can you take us back yeah. to the day and tell us what happened? I was, uh, so it was the summer of 2017 and I was um, on my way to my lunch break. And I just remember um, on my way to my vehicle, and I just had this impression, uh, put your radio on the gospel station and put your phone in your purse. So I obeyed, and then I don't know if it had been five minutes later, I met in an accident, and it was just, I'd say, one of the most traumatic experiences in my life, just turned everything upside down. Right. And were you uh, hit from behind? Like, what happened? Did you just pull out in the street? Or how did the accident happen? I don't have too much um, of a memory for that. I just know that I ended up rear-ending a lady right. to tell you how. And then I just, I, and I explained that in my, in my memoir, I woke up and there was just like a paramedic holding my neck and asking me if I could feel my legs. Wow. I mean, how yeah. traumatic, like you say, like I've read, I've read most of your book here. It's just, it's beautiful. And it really draws you. you into your story. So, so a lot of us can go through traumatic things, but right. you wrote it down for a reason. So what inspired you to write this book, Beauty for Ashes? I'll tell you first, I didn't want to. <laughs> so, um, family and friends and then people who heard about my story they would say hey you really need to write about this and my response was hey I really don't <laughs> right. because um at the time I was struggling with reading comprehension writing so it didn't make sense to me how am I going to write a book and um that was the surface but underneath I was very ashamed and embarrassed about what happened um with everything that I had lost and um, so I just ignored it. I wanted nothing to do with talking about it. And then I noticed the different sermons that I would listen to. The speakers would say, did you start that book? Are you writing that book? Wow. The Lord wants you to write that book. And I said, okay, this is not a coincidence. Yeah. And I said, okay, Lord, how am I going to do this? Because I don't see how it's going to happen. Then I noticed, I, it really dawned on me that the people around me, had little to no information about traumatic brain injury. I said, okay, well, I'll just talk about the different areas that this invisible injury um, just affects and how it just uproots your life and affects the people around you as well. Right. Well, you know what? You've mentioned a few things. There was great loss for you. Like, oh, my days, yeah. Right. Like you're on a career path and successful, and this really was traumatic the brain injury, but all the results from it. Just quickly tell us, what were some of the losses then? What did it look like in your life? Well, so um, as I explained just a moment ago, my comprehension skills um, went down the drain. I was at um, a grade three or just below a grade three math level. My sister had to help me with basic math skills. It came to a point where I couldn't um, write properly or spell I was having difficulty um, counting money. 
remembering things. Um, so the I guess you would say the education piece, the cognitive piece was lost. I lost relationships, friendships, my days, my self confidence, and then I also talk about my loss of I I would say maybe my even my faith mm-hmm. because I really took this as you know I grew up in church. And I took it as, well, the Lord is upset with me, so he wants nothing to do with me. So I even, I would say I even lost my faith at one point. Right, right. You know what? I think there's people watching right now that maybe they're there. What did God yeah. do then? What did God do in this journey of healing? My days. You know, it's hard to see his hand in these traumatic and dark times, but he's there. It's hard to see it. It's hard to believe it, but have faith that he is. And I will tell you, I am not 100% right now, but I'm not where I was. And he has given me this platform to encourage people and say, hang in there. It can get better. Build your foundation with Jesus and see how your life can be transformed and changed. Yes. Wow. That's so good. Because like you say, this is an invisible injury, right? Yes. And so it's hard to even explain to people, but the Lord met you in that sort of feeling invisible, I'm sure. What's been one of the greatest lessons for you that you often like to challenge your readers with? I would say um, give compassion and understanding. You know what I encounter a lot when I explain to people I'm, you know, recovering from a traumatic brain injury, they say, well, you don't look like it. Right. And we often judge folks based on appearance. And we don't know the hidden grief that people are dealing with. And so I would say, and you had spoken on grace at the opening. Give the grace that you would want to receive. We receive the grace of, of, of Jesus every day. Seek understanding for someone's position and say, hey, you know what? How can I help you? What would you like me to say or not say? Sometimes you don't have to say anything. That is so good because I think sometimes it's hard to navigate, you know, what someone needs when you can't visibly yeah. see their need. But you're right, yeah. grace, right, and compassion. Thank you for that. Yeah. You know, just to wrap up here, what's your hope for everyone who uh, will read your book? Oh, man, I would say just there is triumph in, tra- in tragedy. Mm-hmm. Hang in there. It doesn't always come overnight, but... Just believe and do the steps that you need to to take. If you pray, I'm telling you, the Lord will show you what you need to do. Not everything comes with the snap of a finger kind of miracle. You got to do your work yourself. But hang in there. There is triumph. It might not always look like what you want, but it is greater. And your purpose is amazing. Wow. Thank you for that. And, you know, I'm sure you've been inspired as I have been. So I want to encourage you to go to 700club.ca and get Alexis's book right there, Beauty for Ashes. Well, thank you so much, Alexis. And God bless you as you continue to heal and flourish in your life, right? Yes, yes. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. And now this is how Jackie learned that with God, anything is possible. My earliest memory about being, just having gender confusion and such is probably around first grade, first or second. I just distinctly remember wanting to be a boy, um, wanting to be the dominant role in any type of relationship. My aunt, I think I went to church with her pretty much every Sunday for the first nine-ish years of my life. Um, And I just distinctly remember things like when people would get mad at her, she was like not respond. So seeing her life and always hearing about Jesus and hearing about God, it gave me really early convictions about who he was early. I was always attracted to women. I just didn't acknowledge it because I knew it was wrong. It was just kind of this underlying temptation. 17 was probably when that became more of an attraction to me than men. I was at a homecoming dance at another high school, and this young lady that I knew, she flirted with me. And that was the first time a woman ever flirted with me. It felt natural. That's honestly the best way I could describe it. I was like, this is what I want. Gay clubs, 
I, I found interest in those really quickly. Um, gay pride parades. I was having fun, but a deep soul satisfaction, I didn't have that. I used to tell my girlfriends the truth. I was like, hey, you know this is sin, right? And they were like, why are you gay? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I know this is not um, right. To know so much about the truth about God and then to continue to live contrary to it, I was always in this constant state of conviction. I was 19, I was in my room. It was as if every thought I had was just interrupted by this really strong thought that convicted me all at the same time. And it was, it felt as if God was showing me that the sins that I loved and were in would kill me. I would die and go to hell. It's a heavy weight to know that you're a sinner and God is holy. But if that's in the Bible and that's considered true, then the other truths in the Bible about Jesus being God, Jesus being Savior, Jesus being willing to forgive those who turn from their sins, these are both true. And so I just need to believe this. It was really that simple. In my mind, I just kind of had this conversation with God. Like, I don't really want to be straight. Like, I, I, I equated salvation with just being heterosexual overnight. And so it was just like, I don't want to be straight. But then I felt like God was leading me to the fact, like, I can change your desires. I can give you the desire for a man. Surely I'm God. Um, and then I just considered everything I loved and its consequences. Like, I really weighed the cost. Yeah, I, I really saw that I was holistically sinful. This, that this, this, this one area just didn't need Jesus. All, all of me was messed up. Homosexuality is not the only issue plaguing a person. Sin is the issue plaguing a person. This homosexuality is just an outworking of that nature. I just saw like weed and stealing and pride and anger and arrogance and drunkenness and everything was not worth it. Like, it just was overwhelmingly obvious that everything that I loved would not profit me anything but hell. You know what I'm saying? And I saw that God was offering me life, and I knew I had no choice. I either choose God or I choose death. I told God, I said, what you're calling me to do, I cannot do on my own. I've tried before to try to live holy, and it didn't work. But I know enough about you to know that you'll help me. And so I broke up with my girlfriend maybe a day or two later, because I had to. And then um, that was one of the hardest decisions I had to make. But so everything after that was easy. Um, changed my clothes a week later, got into a church in two weeks. Returning to church was cool. They were like really loving people. It was like a family. It was, it was very difficult the first two years, like, God kept me. I think he kept me because I had a community around me. I, if I did not have Christians around me to help me and pour into me and encourage me, I would have been doomed for the most part. Who God says I am defines me, though I may have temptations, though I may have struggles, though I may see a woman that's beautiful and be tempted. Like, I have temptations to curse people out, too. I have temptations to get drunk. I have temptations to watch porn. But... That's just the human experience. The Christian is not void of temptation. The, the temptation got less powerful over time, just as I grew um, in knowing and loving Jesus. Um, but in that place, I didn't want a relationship with a man either. But over time, probably three or so years into my walk is when I started to get an attraction towards Preston. It was weird because it wasn't, I'm attracted to this man. It was like, I'm just attracted to him and all that he is, and he just happens to be a man. And so because I'm attracted to him, I'm more than willing to, to love his masculinity too. I think on my wedding day, it was, it was just kind of surreal. Everything in my life has always just, just been so God. You desire for this marriage and this wedding to just really show off your gospel. And I'm, I'm really grateful to be a part of that presentation. Five weeks after my honeymoon, I found out I was pregnant. I was looking at her and I thought to myself, if I chose to stay in the lifestyle I was in, I would never have her. I wouldn't have her. It wouldn't be Eden. And I, I just cried and thanked God for allowing me to experience that.
The advice I would give to a parent is first and foremost to really trust God because even with my mother and my aunts or the people, the Christians around me, they might not, they may have seen me and seen me in my condition and think, oh, it's hopeless. But they didn't know that I was running into people on the street that were convicting me. They didn't know I was seeing certain commercials that were reminding me of God. They didn't know that I would hear certain gospel songs randomly. Just be faithful, um, keep loving them. God changed me by showing me himself God is aware of what's happening. It's not foreign to him. His son died for them. He loves your children more than you do. I remember trying to push his face towards the gas where the gas uh, was released, and I turned the gas on. Casey Diaz was a mere eight years old when he decided to kill his father using a portable gas heater. And my mom walked in on it. It freaked her out, says, what's going on? And I remember turning to her and telling her, just leave it alone, uh, I'll take the blame. My hope was that he would fall asleep and never wake up. His dad was a violent, abusive alcoholic. He would start literally beating my mom right in front of me. I recall seeing her in, in a closet in her own blood, and there's nothing that you can do. I remember um, in one occasion him grabbing me by the shoulders, bringing me close to him, and he says to me, don't ever call me your dad, don't ever call me dad. And then I remember just feeling a sense of emptiness. You feel worthless, you feel like, why are you even here? I became angry, I became very angry. Casey would find purpose in a South Central LA gang. He easily became violent, stabbing his first victim at just 11 years old. What made it so easy for me to stab somebody is that I put my, the face of my father on every single one of my victims. More victims would follow, as did a lengthy rap sheet. He rose up in the gang world, feared and hunted by rival gangs. At 16, Casey was sentenced to 12 years in a juvenile correction facility for second degree murder and 52 counts of armed robbery. He ruled the gang-infested prison until he attacked another inmate. I, I strangled him almost to death. That landed him in solitary confinement at New Folsom State Penitentiary. One day, a Christian woman, Frances, came by to invite him to a monthly Bible study. You're crazy. You, what are you talking about? Uh, Bible study. And I'm going, there. She, she's not. She doesn't know where, who she's talking to. And she says, you know, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be praying for you. And I'm, I'm putting you on my prayer hit list. You know, she, she uses that word. I said, you could do whatever you want, that's fine. I said, but I'm letting you know right off the bat, uh, not interested in any of your Bible study or whatever religious thing that you're in. Every month for a year, she came by and Casey declined. But each time, her response was the same. And she would always say to me, I'm praying for you and Jesus is gonna use you. In his second year of solitary, he was awake, lying in his bunk. And all of a sudden, um, I start seeing what looks like a movie reel. I'm seeing footage that only I know from me growing up. And it starts to go in, into some details uh, from like the first uh, thing that I ever stole from a 7-Eleven uh, to cars that I stole uh, to the first stabbing that I partook of. Then a different scene appeared. I could see a man carrying this cross, and I saw um, the nails on his hands and his feet. The man addressed Casey by a name, 
my birth name's Darwin. And he says, Darwin, I did this for you. And I could hear in my cell, audibly, his breath leaving him. I hit the center of that floor and wept, weeping uncontrollably, sobbing, and telling God, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry for stabbing this person and stabbing this person over here. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew that something had happened here. Like something, there was this freedom that I had never experienced in my life. Casey says Jesus told him to talk to the prison chaplain. He said, what happened in the cell is what happened in the cell. God has already forgiven you. This is why you feel so free. He prayed with the chaplain to accept Christ. It was God dealing with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis and removing that desire uh, of, of wanting to hurt people. It just went away um, supernaturally. But Casey's faith would be tested. Now 18, he was released from solitary and a hit was placed on his head for becoming a Christian and leaving the gang. One day, an inmate came to a cell with a knife. And he says, I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't do this to you. He says, but whatever you're, whatever you're doing, I'll roll with you. And he became the first person. The first person I led to the Lord was the guy that was assigned to do the hit. The hit was removed, and for the remaining five years of his sentence, Casey would lead over 200 inmates to Christ. At age 25, Casey was released. In time, he forgave his dad, who eventually gave his life to Christ as well. Today, Casey owns a successful sign business and lives in L.A. with his family. Coming to Christ was is and it will always be the best decision that any man could ever make. He is so relentless in his pursuit of us. He's constantly, you know, you might not notice it right away, but God is after the sinner. But his favor and his mercy and his grace, it just floors you. Wow. Uh, it's all I can say after seeing that story. I mean, look at how God pursues us, his mercy, his love, his grace in Casey's life, and to each one of us that are sinners. Romans uh, 5 verse 8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God pursues you and he pursues me, not because we're worthy, but because he loves us even though we're not worthy. He actually makes us worthy. He makes us whole. He transforms our life. Look at Casey's life. It's just a crazy story. He's led 200 people to Christ while he was in jail. And now his dad has come to Christ too. God's full redemption in his life. And you know what? He wants to redeem yours too. I don't know what's happened to you, maybe what you've done or what's been done to you. I want you to know God loves you. He is pursuing you. You can't un outrun his love. Will you surrender to him? Will you just say, God, take over my life. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and I want to follow you. We have a resource that is really powerful. It's called A New Day, and it actually has a few items in here, but one of them is uh, a guide to scripture, and it has t different topics in scripture, and the script tells you where to look in the Bible to find those answers. So why don't you give us a call today for this resource and to have someone pray with you, 1-855-759-0700. We are here for you, and more importantly, God is there for you. Doesn't matter where you are, he sees you right now, and he calls you to himself. So why not surrender to him? He's got great plans for you. We'll be right back.
Well, I've already been reminded of the grace of God in our lives. What beautiful stories today. And won't you help us share this with more people? Because we really can't do this without you. So if you haven't joined us yet, start at $20 a month or your best gift, whatever God leads you to give, and become a 700 Club Canada partner. Together, we can reach more people with stories like you've heard today and the good news of Jesus. Well, as a thank you gift, the latest book by Pat Robertson, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, we'll send this to you. So call us at 1-855-759-0700. And let's do this together to show the grace of God across our nation and beyond. We'll be right back. The Holy Spirit is the mysterious third person of the Trinity, the active power of God throughout the Bible, and God's promise for you today. In his latest book, Pat Robertson unpacks the crucial role of the Holy Spirit in your life, sharing powerful personal testimonies and answering your deepest questions. Get Pat's book and discover how you can have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Call or go online now. Well, we've been reminded that the grace of God is available to everyone, right? Those who believe and those who don't yet believe. So we just want to continue to encourage people to trust God. No matter what situation you're in, He does see you. He has it under control and really you're covered by his grace. Thanks for your part, your partner comments. We are so encouraged when we hear from you. And Paul, you've said thank you for all your hard work and all that the 700 Club Canada does. You're all amazing. Well, I can tell you there's an amazing team that you don't see in this studio and in our office location. So thank you so much. I'll be sure to pass that along to our team. And Gladys said, my husband and I love your program. We watch it every day and pray for you. We so appreciate your heart for souls here in Canada. We are proud to be a part of what you're doing. That means so much. Thank you so much for not only giving, but for being with us each day. So if you haven't yet joined us as a partner, please do that. Become part of our family here at 700 Club Canada. Uh, and let's uh, spread the good news together. I love Hebrews 4, verse 16. It's one of my favorites, actually. It says this, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, I can assure you that Jesus has opened the door to the throne room of mercy and of grace. And all you have to do is go in the door and the heavenly Father will give you all the mercy and grace that you need. So don't delay today. Turn to your heavenly Father. Thanks for watching. God bless. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, a Super Bowl MVP follows God's game plan for his life and panic attacks threaten a successful businesswoman's career.